Hey everyone, it's George Carlos. Welcome back to another compilation video, the third one of 2021 highlights of the Innovators Mindset podcast. And as I did the first two weeks, um, as you listen to this podcast, I focus on lessons that have made an impact on me this year, uh, especially talking to so many great guests. And the, the first one is gratitude, really kind of trying to appreciate the things we have as opposed to always focusing on what we don't have. Um, the second one was really taking care of our own well-being and how important that was. And the one the lesson I want to um, share today is something that I've benefited greatly from doing this podcast is surrounding yourself with great people. And I think that's something I, I really appreciate about the time that we live in is that we can connect with people. I've had the opportunity to connect with people all over the world um, through this podcast. And I always kind of walk out after these shows feeling better than when I entered. Sometimes I'll be honest with you that I dread doing podcasts and I'm, you know, kind of looking as another thing to do with my schedule. But for the most part, I can't say a hundred percent of the time because I'd be lying. But for the most part, when I do these podcasts, I walk away from those conversations feeling better than when I started. And I think that to me is a lesson that I've really taken. I think is really important to me is that, do you surround yourself with people that when you interact with them, they actually give you energy as opposed to suck it out of you? Because I know people that suck energy out of me, right? And I think I've learned, and this is a hard lesson, but it's a lesson. I think it's important that you have to, if you can, actually have don't have people that suck the life out of you in your spaces, in your life, right? And there's always ways that they try to find their way in. But I think that to me is something I've learned. Um, over this past year and I've also really trying to work on being that person for others being the person that when you enter a space with me I hope that you leave feeling better than when you came in so that's something I've been so appreciative of this past year in the innovators mindset podcast so you'll see from this compilation video some of the great guests and why they made me feel so incredible after talking to them so I hope you enjoy this welcome back to another compilation video of the 2021 highlights from the innovators mindset podcast lead with questions right. right like it's so important not to just jump to the exact situation but lead with questions to say okay let me dig a little deeper okay what's going on why is it going on um what can you tell me more about the situation so really and truly it's it's so important one of the things that i led with one of the things that i've realized is just we've got to be able as leaders to say let me take a step. Let mm -hmm. me take a moment mm -hmm. and let me try and to dig a little deeper without, I know we have protocols and we have processes that we need to follow, but abort those to mm -hmm. see the human side of someone else as you are revealing your human side and really lead with questions, lead with understanding before you just drop the hammer. So, okay, there, I'm connecting this to something that I'm feeling uh, is that is like, should be how we treat each other on social media. That is like a really big thing for me. And sure. I've had, and I've had, I've had this happen to me and I've, I, I will tell, I will tell people I've also been this person, right? If I see something I don't agree with or something that bothers me, and it could be something like I'm feeling that day, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm already in a bad mood. So like anything I'm like ready to be attacked. And I've, I've seen this a lot more is that like, oh, you are saying all teachers are horrible. And I've, that's not been, you know, happened to me, but I've seen people get that. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. that's like pretty presumptive, right? Or like, yeah. um, I remember someone said to me, like, you just share this for likes and clicks and just to sell books and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, first of all, I am an author, right? Like, so this kind of need to sell some books like that, like is that's part of my work. But how do you, how do you actually know my intent? Like, how do you know what, like, do you just, you, you do you actually, like, I don't even know what's going on in my own head sometimes, right? So like, you know, in it, I doubt it. And one of the things I always talk about is that sometimes when we get frustrated with how we connect with people online, just exactly what you said, just step back and ask a question. Maybe you're, maybe mm -hmm. you're just misreading something. Cause it could be, yeah. and if they say like, Hey, like I actually, uh, I, this, I do think teachers are bad then, then have at it. Right. Then if that's <laughs> what you think, then if that's what they say, then yeah, okay, you were right. And now you can push back. But I think a lot of times we make those assumptions and that 
that causes more issues long term, right? Because especially when we, I think when you're talking about that from the viewpoint of an administrator, it, let's say you have that conversation with a parent and you just assume attack them. What is that parent mm-hmm. going to do? They're going to talk to all these other parents who say like, yes. yeah, it means this way. Whereas the same thing online, someone attacks me for something and I'm thinking, Hey, look, I can mute you. I might not pay attention to you, but all these other people who want to dip their toe in are not dipping their toe in. Cause they saw it and they're like, I don't want to be that person. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I, I, we don't realize that we a lot of times come with assumptions when we see things and hear things and the way in which we do process, especially in school building process and procedures. We go in classrooms, we assume that instruction mm-hmm. is supposed to look like this. We assume that students are supposed to act this way. But a lot of times we've got to kind of be aware of our own assumptions and start to question and if we begin to start with questions we begin to make a connection we begin to build understanding and now we can change those assumptions and change our thinking to kind of not necessarily fit but more Mm. so accommodate the individuals around us yeah and it's the it's the covey seek first to understand before being understood right it's like i i love the covey stuff i've always resonated with it because it it feels like common sense but it also you know it's kind of like frames it But there's something I want to ask you about because I, when I feel, when I talk to you, when I read your stuff, when I see your posts on social media, one thing that, you know, like this is like, like no, no matter what the pedagogy, your leadership style, any of this stuff, like I'm sure people have criticized you for elements in your lifetime. Right. I don't think anyone could ever criticize you that you don't believe in kids and believe in their abilities or believe in their abilities to flourish. Do you think that matters? Like, you know, like how much does, well, I know you know it matters. How much does that actually matter in the development of a kid? Just that belief that you have in them. It's, it's a game changer. It is the great equalizer. When people talk about equity today, mm-hmm. I think the idea is that every child, you know, my, my motto is every child deserves at least one person to be crazy about them. Yep. Um, but I also believe that, that the children must know that we have, when, we, when they know that we have the belief that they're intelligent, that they can be successful, that they're capable. It, it, it gives them this feeling that they're able, that they, that they, that that uh, intelligence crosses all racial lines, mm-hmm. all religious lines, all, all, all social lines, economic lines. That it, even even if that child has had some adult in the past who doubted them every day, whether because of implicit or explicit bias, mm-hmm. the fact that an adult believes in them gives them the power. They, and I hear people, when you hear people talk about these stories all the time, how they had this one person who believed right. in them so much that they started believing that they could do it. Like they started believing, yeah, I, I, I can go to school. I can be successful. Yep. I, 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 I can get a job. I, I can start my own company. Um, so I, I believe that the most important thing that we can do for kids is let kids know that we loved you before we ever met you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you do or say, it's not going to change the way I feel about you. And for some children, they don't hear that often, that people love and care about them. And oftentimes when they hear it, it'll be from some adult in some schoolhouse, you know, somewhere. So it's, um, I'll never get accused of that. I might get accused of loving them too much. My teachers say, principal, I always want to give them everything, you know. And they know I, I just, I just, and they know I, I, I love them. And I'm just so thankful for the teachers I work with who support me all the Saturday schools and the summers and all the things that we do. And I take care of my teachers too, because I know they give so much of themselves. So we must take care of teachers. But my first book was I choose to stay. Mm-hmm. And that's a choice I made. And the kids actually came up with that, with that title because um, I turned down a big raise, you know, uh, when I was offered to leave the school and they told me, thanks for choosing to stay. But you know what they also said to me though, George, that I don't, that I didn't mm-hmm. think about that we choose to be here as well. Yeah. That we, that, that we have children, their families, they can be anywhere, but they choose to be in our presence. I posted on Twitter the other day, a poem often about, you know, I ain't got a pencil. And all the things, you know, this kid is talking about, you know, getting his sister right. dressed for school, no heat, no parent. And, 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 and gets to school, gets them a warm breakfast and gets to class. And then the teacher fusses with him because he ain't got a pencil. Right. Right. And I, th- I was that teacher at one time, you know, if you don't, yep. you're not ready for life. You're not ready for school, but I needed to understand that these children go through so much just to be in our presence. And this pandemic has uncovered a lot of that for folks mm-hmm. who were in denial. 
that yes these children struggle often and when they get to but they they want to be with us so yeah that that's a five minute response to a five second question hey. but that that belief that that belief is so important for their resilience their self-efficacy their self-esteem their self-confidence when we improve all of those constructs for children then we're building them to, to deal with any failure any struggle in life because we can't change we can't alter that they will struggle they they will have to overcome obstacles and barriers but when but when but when, when when failure is normative resilience becomes second nature and that's what believing in kids does how long have you been teaching for ryan like how long have you been in this, my, this is my 14th year 14th year so did did actually like did an entrepreneurship class exist when you first started teaching so it didn't exist, I don't think, when I first started, but it did exist while I was still teaching some other courses. Yeah. Um, and then I went back to school in the evenings and I did my MBA um, yeah. in 2011. And when I finished my master's of business, um, I kind of asked to take over the entrepreneurship course. And uh, so I've been teaching it since 2013. And uh, since then, it's grown into a, uh, a pretty interesting course in school that um, We've grown in sections of it and what what's uh kind of neat about the course is that students actually um come into the course and they invest their own money and they start up their own company and they run it for a series of weeks from ideation right up mm -hmm. to marketing right up to um sales and then they really? um close the company down, distribute profits to shareholders and basically run through the whole business process um, in a matter of, of a couple months. So. Okay. So I got to ask you this and this is going to be someone, someone's going to wonder this too, listening to this. So what, like you're telling me that students actually invest their own money in this process. So what, yeah, about, so that, that, that's, that's something that happens there. Yeah. So oh, we, so we partner with junior achievement PEI okay. uh, and, uh, the, they can invest up to a maximum of $20. Um, oh, okay. It, okay. It is the most a, per, a person can invest. So if there's six people in a company, um, they can invest $120 or they can That's get right. outside investors as well, but no one can invest more than $20 individually um, okay. per person. And, uh, and then of course, you know, if there are situations where a student um, is struggling to find the, right. the money to invest, the, the, the junior achievement or, or the school comes mm -hmm. in at, at that point to make sure it's equitable and accessible Good. to everybody. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I think there's a, you know, that's one thing is that it, it's a lot easier to actually make money when you start with money. Right. Yeah. And I think part of that too, is that you have to make sure that that experience, cause like listening to that, and I'm, I'm going to ask you more about it. Like you talk about like the whole notion of like preparing kids to the real world is not really valid because they already live in a real world. You know, it's kind of like, like, you know, when you're 18, then it becomes real all of a sudden. It's a very real thing that we live in and creating like, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a difference between, for me, creating relevant experiences versus real experiences, right? And what you're right. doing is creating a real experience. So like, like what's something that maybe has been created from that class? Like what's something that you saw students do? What was like a, like a success story that you have? Um, we've had there's been there's been lots of success stories i'm trying to think of one that a, a recent one that i thought was kind of neat was a group of guys actually they got mm -hmm. together and uh and they had a connection with um a radio station uh in pei and they decided that they were going to make candles and so they made homemade candles but they decided that they were going to give half of their profits to uh, Toys for Tots, which is a, a fundraiser mm -hmm. come, comes around Christmas time. And uh, they used their connection with the radio station to advertise this. And they ended up, I forget how many thousands of candles they sold, but they ended up making a few thousand dollars for themselves and raising a few thousand wow. dollars for Toys for Tots and uh, had quite a name for themselves. And, and I remember after the holidays, um, when we were talking about everybody's holiday, um, some of the guys said, you know, the best part of Christmas was actually waking up Christmas morning, right. thinking that all those toys that we were able to buy for kids who, you know, they don't know who opened them, but uh, they had that feeling of, of contributing to society through entrepreneurship. So it was, it was a really cool experience for them. 
I, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think sometimes when people look at entrepreneurship, it's like, it's all about, you know, greed, but I think sometimes it's, it's really about finding ways that you can, you know, you can make a living, do certain things, but also helping. Now there is obviously examples of where it's just pure greed and things like that, but really sure. learning how to like, you know, give to others and, you know, you take care of people in need is, you know, I, I, that's a really important part of that story. So I love that you share that knowing how to communicate to get the best result and sometimes i would speak you know my way and then the last thing, thing i would say is you know my way is not always the best way mm -hmm. um and being able to at 27 hear diversity of thought and work to uh hear everyone's input and buy-in and then work to a greater resolution and resolve that was something great for kids and knowing that everybody is a champion and uh, and in that championship piece, giving people the equal opportunity to be a part of it. So that's what I would tell my 27, 28 year old self uh, when I came into administration. Yeah, and that's like, I, I think when you talk about the notion of di diversity of thought, I think that's something that's really important because we have our own perspectives, we have our own experiences um, in what we do. And I think a lot of times and this is something I've, I've seen in the past is that, you know, as administrators, I've seen people hire basically clones of themselves. So if you're the principal, you hire like a clone assistant principal that kind of thinks like mm -hmm. you has the same stuff as you and all these other things. And I feel that not only does that not help you grow as an organization, but I also feel it kind of disenfranchises like a, a, maybe a group of people that would rather talk to the assistant principal than the principal. And when you, right. when you said this, I actually remember, and this will, um, this will kind of probably floor you. Um, I actually had my first interview for an assistant principal job. And I never, like, I didn't even want to be an assistant principal. I would, I don't even know why I applied. I think my te my principal at the time said, you should apply for this. And like, I think I got an interview because it was in the middle of summer and everyone was gone on vacation. And so they didn't see the hiring. <laughs> so there was like probably uh -huh. like five people that applied. And so I just kind of got right. an interview by default. And so I had this um, interview with this gentleman named Archie Lillico, and he was, uh, he's someone I'm very close with now, but at the, at the interview, you know, we're like, Hey, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Five minutes in, we're like yelling at each other and wow. arguing and just going back and forth. Right. And he's mm -hmm. kind of getting under my skin. I'm obviously getting under his skin. And so I like walked out of there. I feel like I was sweating. <laughs> like it was just such right. a horrible experience. And wow. I called my principal at the time. I said, that was like the worst interview ever. And she said, you know, Archie, I know him really well. I, I don't think it was as bad as you think it was. I'm like, it was just horrible. And so then he called me and it like, is like basically like, a, I'm like, here's the courtesy call. Like, thanks for applying. We decided to go with someone else. And they said, Hey, I, I actually, um, uh, I, I just want, I'm, I'm really glad uh, that you had the time for the interview and I'd like to offer you the job. I was like, excuse me, you seriously you want to uh, offer me the job? Yeah. 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 And I said, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't think we really hit it off. He said, the reason I want to hire you is you're the only one who challenged me on anything I said. And I actually mm. want someone who does that. I want someone who pushes me because at the end of the day, when we walk out of here, when we walk yeah. to the office, like you're, it's actually, I'm the principal. So, I have to make the final decision. If, if there's an issue with the decision, it's always going to fall back on me. But I want to make sure that I hire someone who's going to challenge me and say, like, you need to rethink this or do this. But when we walk out of that office together, we got to be on the same team. And he said, no one else challenged me. And, and I was like, I still don't know if I don't work with you. Because I was like... <laughs> But then he's like, and then he's like, no, you got to decide. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take the job. And he shaped a lot of how I thought in that experience yeah. because he showed me the importance of, of not just having different perspectives, but acting upon them. Because I think a lot of times we say like, hey, it's really important that we have people that think different, but not if we don't do right. anything different because of it. Right. Correct. And, and like, I'm sure that's you know, in your career as you're talking, you know, how has that benefited you to like bring in those different perspectives, different voices and actually act like, how has that actually helped you in your work? It's, it's helped me immensely. Um, as you know, in school turnaround, and that's been pretty much the, the last eight, 12 years of my career has been in school turnaround and turnaround underperforming schools and failing schools. 
And what I've learned so much in that piece in school turnaround that it takes the village to, to move the needle, to move student achievement. And when you get people in the room um, and hear the diversity of thought processes and, 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 and all that, it, it creates a level of synergy that, you know, they can't be, un, they can't be denied. Um, and what comes of that is the national item process or, or framework that moves the needle for, teach, for everyone in that building um, and, and also in the district as well too. So I've learned that also, the second thing that I've learned that if you're the smartest one in the room, it doesn't work. And that you have to surround yourself with people. And that's the thing about a, a good sign of intelligence um, and success and a recipe is for success is when you put other people around you that are, that are that are equally just as smart as you are smarter, that can help bring these things to life and, and bring the vision to life and bring the activities, the goals to life. And that's what helps you lead school turnaround, school change and change paradigms, mindset, belief systems and attitudes that allows the, 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 the company, the organization to flourish is when we're able to do that. And I've seen it work every single time for me. And um, being the, and sometimes as administrators, you know, we don't have to always be evaluative. We can be the thought, the thought tank partner. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes people just need a thought tank partner, not so much, and let me hear what you're trying to say and let me take that and let's create something. So let me help you think about some of the areas that you may not have thought about and then, but it's your original thought. I'm just a thought tank partner to help push your thinking. Having a, um, a a huge part of my classroom and has always been kind of a core principle for me as a teacher is um, starting the day on a positive note and doing a morning meeting and talking about the core principles of having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset or perseverance. Um, so doing those things. And when we first started our podcast, it was... Um, the mission was to inspire and spread positive messages around the world. So getting kids to um, take those messages, have to write their own scripts, kind of formulate their own. A lot of times, you know, fourth graders and nine year olds, they love to write little skits that mm -hmm. proves their point um, and perform them on the podcast. So getting them to take that learning and, you know, it could be a journal prompt, but if it's a one, they're going to write one sentence, shut the journal, no one's going to look at it. Right. When we look at the podcast and you can see that in the first 24 hours, it was viewed in 14 different countries around the world. Like that makes it real for them. Um, and it also kind of taps into that idea when we go around on the first day of school, like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's no longer doctor, teacher, firefighter, lawyer. Right. It's YouTuber, Twitch streamer. Right. So like instead of fighting against that, mm -hmm. why not harness it and right. let them have a platform that's safe, that we, we are helping them um, cultivate and build um, within our school system. So I think that's part of it. So Yeah, and that, another example I'll just share really quick is um, another time when we had to do a lot of learning ourselves, um, and that was when we were invited to go to Chicago uh, to one of Apple's uh, like corporate headquarters, yep. and we learned about um, some some of the coding apps that they were offering, and uh, you know they had this campaign everyone can code, and so we had I I'm not a computer scientist I don't right. I don't know anything but um, you know they say that computer coding or you know knowing that as a language or knowing that as a as a way to convey meaning uh, is one of the most important skills that people will need in the future. So bringing this back, we like after we learned from experts in Chicago, then we got to help our students learn a little bit of basic coding with a couple of different apps on their iPads. And then um, we said, all right, so now we're going to think about a problem that you that you can identify in the world and design an app. So taking them through like kind of the design thinking process, uh, design an app that would help to solve that problem. And they made um, basically these app prototypes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had a showcase day where uh, you know, we took over the cafeteria and we invited our school board members, we invited our central office team, we invited um, some of the uh, computer teachers from the high school and middle school to come and check out like their ideas and their app ideas were amazing. Um, but giving them that audience, giving them, uh, you know, saying like, this is the, the showcase date. So you, you mm -hmm. all of the work that you're doing is going to be shared with the world on this at this time. It made it real. It wasn't just for the teacher as the, as the only audience member. And it, the motivation was incredible. And like I said, the, the results that we got were, were just awesome. It was also, that one was also an authentic task where right. it was like so, 
create an app to solve a real world problem. So it, it had all of those elements built into it. When, when thinking about going to administration, I knew that Bayshore was the only place that I wanted yeah. to be an administrator in because of the way that you felt um, in the buildings. Mm -hmm. Everyone was pleasant. Everyone wanted to help you. And I wanted to keep that going as the school leader where the culture that I cultivated was one where when someone walked through that front door, that they felt like they were already home, that mm -hmm. they were already mm -hmm. welcome, and that they were already a part of something, and that they mattered. Mm -hmm. Because all throughout my years, both you know growing up as a kid and then um, teaching, I was in the shadows. Whether I put myself there or whether I was made to um, sort of know my place. Mm -hmm. And I say that because I just finished reading the book Cast, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about sort of the, the um, situations that make people feel like, um, like they need to be silent more than they need to speak. And more about um, recognizing that when people feel heard, they actually contribute more mm -hmm. to the culture and environment because they then are empowered to do things, share things that at times they might have been silent about. Mm -hmm. And it's those different voices that I try to encourage and that um, I, I seek to make sure that I include. I try to amplify the voices of the quietest person mm -hmm. in the room because I recognize that once I do that and once I support them and once I encourage that, that they excel far beyond what they themselves even thought mm -hmm. was possible. Well, they, they, so it's, it's interesting, like, you know, we like you, you kind of joke a little bit about the photocopier thing, but there's something really big about that. Right. And when you say about how it, it's 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 like I want to be at a place where I feel appreciated where it's it's not just you say it the actions line up and it's like it's like saying oh like we so appreciate teachers like they're the best and but we need you to kind of spend all your own money and we need you to do this and we're not going to really like, do these things and so like but we so appreciate you <laughs> and it's like well not really like none of your actions are lining up with that and i always talk about the difference uh that there is a really important and it, it's like you you exemplified the story is that there is a difference between being valued and feeling valued. And when you did the photocopier thing, that was you feeling valued. And like, that's, that's what I want to be. And I think when we get that feeling, we want to create that for others too, where they have this, this, this is going to be, this isn't just, this is, I think this is just our school district, but it, this was a, such a subtle thing. It was just a, a little thing. And this might like throw off some people listening to this. So when I was a principal, every staff member had their own school credit card, right? Like they had a legitimate, their own credit card and they had, a, <laughs> and they had, a, I'm not even kidding. They had a, they had like a certain, I'm like, what? yeah, they had a certain <laughs> limit of like what they would do so that they wouldn't like, there was not even the step of like, you go buy stuff and then we'll reimburse you. It's like, no, you use a credit card. And like, if we see you're buying a sports car, like we're going to flag that and there's going to be something there. <laughs> and like, you had to like, you know, say like, yeah, I bought this, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't like we didn't even want that temporary and like just even thinking about it, there's times in my career where like I was I had a thousand dollar overdraft and I was like always within twenty dollars of it at the end of each month. So I couldn't spend an extra twenty five bucks, right, on school supplies. Yeah. And like you know, I like I remember that was something I really struggled with. And so that was never something that a teacher had to deal with. And we'd say like, Hey, you got like an X amount of limit for the year, but if you need to go beyond it, just, just come and talk to me and we'll like, wow. you know, and so like little things like that make a difference. And I think a lot of people, when they, um, when they actually see that, like when they actually, um, that little thing is something about making sure people feel appreciated. <laughs>